Hey there, my name's Jonathan McNair. I'm a missionary serving in Honduras with GMDMI, and today we are getting to do something awesome. This whole week, we're gonna be changing this roof on this pastor's house, Pastor McDonio here in Las Pacayas, where we've been doing discipleship work for three years. Um, he's been doing some amazing things. God's been doing some awesome things, but we found out about uh, their roof and it had some leaks. So uh, some generous donors stepped up and here we are this week changing the roof and we're just super excited to be able to give them this blessing. Guys, I want to introduce you to Pastor McDonia, who we've been partnering with for three years in discipleship. So y'all come on. Pastor McDonia, come here, please. We would like to introduce you. So um, we're here changing this roof, and we want to know a little bit about you and your family. Um, so could you tell us a little about you and your family? Yes. Good afternoon. My name is McDonia Rocha. And this is my family, my wife, Ana Espinal, my son, Jair, Atali, and Manaen. Such a beautiful family. A very precious family that the Lord has blessed us with. We met uh, about three years ago, Pastor, um, and it's just been a pleasure getting to know the family. Um, and so we're here changing this roof, um, and we'd like to know, about how old was this roof? This roof was 80 years old. 80 years old. Wow. I remember when we were uh, taking it out and uh, the wood was just super rotten. Um, and so it's definitely a pleasure for us to change it. Um, so we just we want to thank you because you've always been working and serving alongside us and for the Lord. Um, and it really is a blessing for us to be able to bless you in this way. Thank you too, because it's taken a lot of time and effort for you to come here and help us and we make an excellent team. And thanks to the families in the United States, because with a lot of dedication, they made things possible. Thank the Lord for all of that. The story of this roof begins 18 years ago. It begins when my youngest son, Manaen, was one year old when we came to this house. That's when the leaking started. The roof was made of clay tiles. So we would put some things up there to cover up the, the leaky spots. because we couldn't replace the material. So we saw the need to pray, to pray to the Lord for a new roof. And of course, he answers in his timing. We thank God because the work is now in progress. It has a lot of history. We were told at the beginning that the roof was built 80 years ago, a long time ago. And yes, we replaced some of the wood, but not the clay tile. It was too old, so it would break easily. So we've been praying because in one way or another, we'd notice the condition of the roof he would replace things but it would still be the same because the wood that my husband would get um, and would use for replacements it would be old wood and if the leak stopped a new one would appear in another place in the bedrooms in the kitchen um, just now we were looking where my son Yair was standing and said the leak is gone the storms have been really strong and he would get up thinking the house is going to fall on us or the roof you could see it was completely damaged the Lord has been faithful Yair was telling me mom what God has given us is enough 
I might need a job or money, but this has been the best thing that he has given us. I'm speechless. I'd like to work either part-time or full-time with some of the churches in our area doing my struggle. I've got discipleship in my heart. And sometimes I, I feel bad because I feel like I'm not doing anything right now. Just recently, I was talking to Pastor Luis from Santa Rosa and some other pastors that have slowed down. So that's something I, I want to see in the next few years. That's what I want to see, either full-time or part-time, to train the pastors in churches in our areas so that the churches can have people that have the knowledge to disciple others. That is my vision. The Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The important thing right now is, who can we help grow deeper in their knowledge of their scriptures? family uh man it's just been such a great two weeks here with pastor mcdonio i hope you guys enjoyed watching the video the whole process happened um they've been with us uh, for the last two weeks putting this roof on um we definitely came ac uh, across a couple of frustrations um as all construction projects do um but it's, it's just been a good time we've really enjoyed ourselves uh eating breaks with them lunch dinner um just the great views we've had from here but also just just working together to get something done uh, uh just means something to us um and I don't know, we've just, we've just really enjoyed it. Um, I'd like to uh, just tell you guys thank you because you guys got together, you donated money to make this happen, and without you, um, this it wouldn't have happened. I mean, this was something you guys, your money was sent down here, and we were able to buy the materials and to do this job. And so just thank you so much. Um, it means so much to me and my family when you guys support us. We know you pray for us. Um, we know you think about us and talk about us, um, but also when you support us financially, it's just... It just means a lot to us. So we thank you so much for that, and I just hope you enjoyed the video. All right. Today's chapter in Genesis is a nasty one. We come to these chapters in the Old Testament and, uh, you know, your, your, your Bible may have a head. I'm not sure what. So the defiling of Dinah is how this is chapter 34 of Genesis. The defiling of Dinah. This is a horrible story. And, and uh, I, I drove by. I had a long, long road trip this week. And, and uh, I listened to sermons or, or not sermons. Uh, there's not. You can't find a bunch of sermons on this one. Uh, but I did listen to some good teaching, I believe. And, and uh, uh, the, thought, the thought is, like, there's nothing, at least on the surface, there's nothing redeeming about what's fixing to happen. That is to say, don't emulate anybody that we're about to read about. Nobody handles this well. Nobody does. <coughs> so, let it, so contextually, I'd like to get us to a place where we can just concentrate on how in the world did this come to be what we're about to read it's horrible so what I want to do is I want to begin by jumping back to last week and reading the last few verses of 33 of Genesis 33 and so this is 18 19 and 20 of chapter 33 Jacob is just reconciled with his brother uh and Jacob verse 18 came safely to the city of Shechem which is in the land of Canaan, on his way from Padanaram, and he camped before the city. And from the sons of Hamor, we're going we're to talk about all these names, Shechem's father, he bought for a hundred pieces of money, nobody knows how much that is, 
the piece of land on which he had pitched his tent. And there he erected an altar and called it El Elo Israel, which means God, the God of Israel. So here is what, this is just in simple terms what has happened. There is a city that we honestly don't know much about called Shechem. The ruler of, of Shechem is a guy named Hamor. Now, he's described using words like prince. We don't know what authority had, he had in the city uh, legally, but for sure you're about to see he had some really crazy sway among the men of the city. He has a son whose name is Shechem. So the city is Shechem and the son is Shechem. That's really important because you can read this. And So listen, Shechem's the city. Hamor is the, I'm going to use this word, he's the ruler. And he has a son named Shechem. So Shechem could have been named after the boy Shechem or Shechem the boy could have been named after the city. These are things we don't know. Other things we don't know. We have no idea how big the city is. So what you're probably tempted to believe when you read stories like when you read this is that it was like, you know, two or 3,000 people. I'm just making a number up. There's no reason to think it was a large city at all. This is ancient. We're talking about ancient civilization. And somehow, Hamor came to be the ruler of, there's this implication, this passive implication, a relatively small settlement. Hamor owned a bunch of land, we're going to find out. And he also, and so this is how the world worked back then, there was no suburb. Nobody lived in, there was no such concept. For safety, people would have lived in a very, they would have slept and eaten in a very concentrated area, and they would have farmed and or uh, tended flocks in those areas around this concentrated city proper. And what we just learned is that Jacob pitched his tent in sight of the city. So, so envision a, a, a settlement and Jacob, and don't forget, this is super important, who was fabulously wealthy and had probably thousands of head of livestock, one day set up camp next to this city. So, so Jake, everybody in the city would have been like, what in the world is going on? Have y'all seen this dude? Have you seen his family and his servants and his camels and all this kind of stuff? So he was, it was a big deal that he had set up next to this city. Chapter 34. I'm going to read, this is how we're going to do this. I'm going to read the first three verses and we're going to just shred them. We're just going to tear them apart. We're going to get everything we can out of them. And then there's a long narrative about this tragic, uh, tragic circumstance, and then we're going to make some application. All right, so I'm going to read these first four verses. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob, so Leah had a daughter named Dinah, Jacob's the dad, went out to see the women of the land. And when Shechem the son of Hamor the Hivite, the prince of the land, so Hamor's the prince, has a son named Shechem. When Shechem saw her, he seized her and lay with her and humiliated her. And his soul was drawn to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, Get me this girl for my wife. This is a bad start to, a, to, to this. So let's go, there's, there's so much to, to glean from this. The first is, let's, let's make sure we're thinking rightly about who Dinah was. Now, Jacob had two wives. The first wife that he, he got, or was given more accurately, was Leah. And she was famously unloved. Leah uh, was never treated, it, it seems that, that just sinfully, Jacob only had a legal attachment to Leah, and Leah had a bunch of kids, had a bunch of sons, had one daughter that we know named, named Dinah, 
And we have learned enough about Jacob to know that he much, much favored his other wife, or one of his other wives, Rachel. And Rachel has some kids, and we're going to see just crazy favoritism toward Rachel and Rachel's kids when we get over to, to uh, the end of the, the very uh, important end of Genesis. But there may be something to consider in the fact that Dinah was the daughter of the unloved wife. Okay, And we see Dinah, we're introduced to Dinah, and it says that, sh that she went out to see the women of the land. Uh, I want to be careful that we don't read too much into this, but it was written and recorded for some reason in God's providence, and perhaps the reason it was written and recorded was for us to see that it is very potentially dangerous to wander out into these the, the pagan, if you will. So Dinah, who would have been a big deal in the city, this settlement, she would have been a big deal because, hey, who's the new girl? Oh, that's that rich man's daughter, right? They're, they're just try to imagine what it might have been like. We don't know exactly how old she is other than to say that she was not old at all. But So we don't know if she was 14 or if she was 18 or 22. Some, she's called a damsel in some translations, which is my favorite because I just want to use the word damsel a lot. I think that's a great word we just neglected. And, but she's a young, it seems that she's beautiful, and she finds herself in this very first verse, unattended, curious about, wanting to know about perhaps this pagan world that's right outside her door. And this is what happens. Shechem who is the son of the prince, Shechem, saw her, seized her, he laid with her, and humiliated her. Here's what all that means. <clears throat> First of all, it says that he seized her. The Hebrew word, I, uh, hey, somebody, let's just do this. Let's, let's ring this out as best we can. Verse 2, if you have some translation other than ESV, read it out loud. So if I'm reading from the English Standard Version, but if you've got another translation, and some of them are really similar, read it out loud, verse 2. It's pretty straightforward. Anything else? Anybody else? That's NASB, New American Standard. The point is this, that this was horrible what happened. Now, the third verse is really confusing, and we're going to talk about that. But please don't read the second verse and then the third verse and let the third verse weaken the second verse. You understand what I just said? So we're fixing to find out that in some sense he loved her. But the Hebrew is unmistakable. And here's what I mean. The, the phrase seized her in Hebrew means to become, er, so that seized, to become or to be arrogantly disrespectful or to have audacity. So there was a, there was a, a way that he did this that there's this overarching grossness about it. He, he, he in arrogance, in boldness, with audacity did this. And then it says that he laid with her. The, the tense in Hebrew is he made her to lie down. And this is why the NA, NASB interestingly uses forced her. Or, or he, there was a force involved. And then it says the effect of this was that he, that in the ESV, humiliated her. And a very interesting Hebrew word that means caused her to be afflicted or caused her to be oppressed. This was a... a in all rape is uncalled for. This was a brutal mismatch of power. A man who in that brutal mismatch was willing to take advantage of a young girl. He raped her. And the effects, I, I want to explain interestingly the effect. Why was she, how was this oppressive? Well, in one way, for sure, rape is oppressive. It, it is a traumatic, uh, horrible thing that happens. But here's some good commentary. Leon Morris says, 
unattached young women were considered fair game in the cities of that time in which promiscuity was not only common, but in fact, he says, a part of the very religious system itself. And so there's, remember, this is a people of God represented by Jacob's family next to a pagan people. And the perversions of their religion included the right to take for themselves women who were unattended. Now, ironically, Dinah was physically unattended, but we're going to see she was very much not unattended by her family. Her family cared about her. Here is the very academic H.C. Leupold, who is a, he was a, a, a Lutheran commentator, Old Testament scholar from the 19, well, he did most of his writing in the first two and a half or three decades of, of uh, the 1900s. This occurrence serves, he says, to illustrate the low standard of morals prevalent among the Canaanites. Any unattended female could be raped, and in the transactions that ensue, neither father nor son feel the need to apologize for excusing what had been committed. That is to say, we're about to see, to our modern eyes and to any moral eye, this was a horrible thing, but apparently... Hamor the dad and Shechem the son didn't think enough of it to even broach the subject of the horror of the rape with Jacob and or Jacob's children. Do you see how perverted this is? All right. There's no, this verse 3, here's my note to myself. There's no clear way to understand this verse. The, The easiest teaching. Verse 3, and his soul was drawn to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. Somebody take a stab at it. He raped her and loved her. Really, take a stab at it. What could this mean? And so, he, because he didn't see any crime in what he had done, There was nothing weird to him about having affection for her. That's one. You're not going to be wrong. Take a stab at it. Your, Your point is it wasn't wrong for him. And he even, and so uh, this is the second big theory that you find in commentators. He might have genuinely had affection for her somehow, but because of who he was, the, the civilization that he found himself in, this universally harmful brutality was the means he sinfully chose, even if he didn't know it was sinful, like no excuses for Shechem, right? I'm not saying that it was okay. But he just went about this a horrible way, trying to do something that, that in his, his own heart felt okay. Is there any other, you might have any other thoughts. How else, what else could, what else maybe, or again, I don't know what, nobody knows. The commentary is just, in every sense, this is hard to explain. That, but there is one other big idea that you, that, that you see speculated about. I'm sorry, I actually love you. So here's... That is similar. Let me let me put it in. Just having read a bunch of comments, so let me let me on that idea. Let me tell you how this might have looked. He could have been just a completely twisted, evil soul, and he felt some situational sorrow for what he had done. But without being sorry, certainly in a godly sense. He just drove forward with this idea that she's going to be mine, and he began to say what needed to be said to console her. But never did he have a heart that was in any way a godly husband. He he had no desire to, to love her well. 
And so we're left to not, not know if he was just ignorant. He was ignorant. Or if he was a psychopath, so to speak. Nevertheless, he decides, verse 5 now, so Shechem spoke to his father Hamor saying, get this girl for my wife. Plot twist. You ready? Plot twist. Remember that I said the word seized up there carried this idea of bold arrogance? In the Hebrew, get in the sentence, get me this girl for my wife. Get and seized are the same Hebrew word. Get, with audacity, he said, get this girl to be my wife. And so Hamor, being very foolish, this prince of Shechem, who had authority in the city, who likely knew the circumstance, goes to bat for his son. That's how horrible this story is. Any comments about this story? I don't know why movies, I read the Bible with movies in mind. I have no idea why. I'm not saying you should. I'm saying it might be bad. But, like, this is a movie. This is a movie where a, a powerful person rapes a girl and then, in the most twisted way, says, I want to take, I want to own you the rest of my life. And so he begins to say these twisted things to her under the guise of love to just get what he wants. Any other comments? And, and so the, the one step further in that thought is if you choose to have sex outside of marriage, even if it's consensual, it's harmful. Anything else? So I want to be so that's where my just confession that's where my mind goes when I'm envisioning this that's what I see but some commentators pointed out that there's not enough there to make that I, so listen that's where my heart goes but the Hebrew doesn't say enough for us to know that's what it was but that is where my heart goes Certainly not so not, on, not only, like I read before, would she have had. So we've all talked about this. Even when we fast forward thousands of years and we get to the New Testament, a woman was not valued in society. There, there had been some progress made because we know by the time we get to the New Testament that they could own businesses and that they could be successful financially at least. But in the, in the government, they still had no standing. But strip that away, and we've got Dinah, who's potentially, to your point, very young, who has no standing in Sadly, her father's household, much less in the household of a pagan country, and she is in a terrible situation. Now, I want to jump ahead, and, and we, we've got to hurry, but I want to jump ahead, and I want you to see that it seems that in verse 26, spoiler alert, they killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword and took down... Dinah out of Shechem's house and went away. So some commentators point out here that it could be from the moment he raped her until she's wrongfully avenged, we're about to see, that she was already property to him. What they wanted was a deal worked out between the two families so there would be no shame. We, let's, let's just, you'll, you'll see what we're about to study, but like, let's just tend to this. She's going to be my wife. What can we do, in, what, what can we do to make this okay? <coughs> All right. Somebody read. It's, 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 there's no. There's nothing difficult. Uh, there's no. No big big words. Uh, <coughs> read. Read. Uh, somebody read from eight. Somebody read from five to twenty-four. Five to twenty-four. Get after it, somebody.
go. Go, 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 go. Read that again. What a horrible set of players. Again, no one is to be emulated here. This is not a narrative that we're to glean like, oh, so this is what we should do in these circumstances. Nobody is to be emulated. Nobody. There's not a good player in this. So here's what happened. As we just read, Hamor goes to Jacob and says, man, my son, this most valued son of mine, he wants, your, he wants Dinah to be his wife. What's it going to take? Shechem seems to be in the audience, and he speaks up and says, name your price. Name a big, challenges Jacob. You name a big bride price, and it's yours. But I want her to be my wife. Now, there's an interesting little point here. When Jacob is made aware of Dinah being raped, did, you, did, anybody, did, did anybody perk up when it said he really didn't do anything, he waited until his sons got home? You notice that? Well, if you didn't, let's read it. Uh, where is that? <coughs> Verse 5. Now, Jacob heard that he had defiled his daughter Dinah, but his sons were with his livestock in the field, so Jacob held his peace until they came. Another verse. No commentator makes claim to know exactly what it means. What would be reasons why Jacob would, would wait until his sons get back? It's immediately what I think. There are other ideas. I can't hear. <laughs> what? What did you start to say? Sorry. 
specifically commentators point that out. Because the two brothers, Simon, Simeon and Levi, were whole sis, uh, no, whole brothers to Dinah. So we don't know enough, again, we don't know enough to say why he waited. But he did wait. Some commentators point that Jacob could have been just, he wanted the wisdom. So again, these older brothers of Dinah, Simeon and Levi would have already had some standing and maybe the benefit of the doubt would be to say of Jacob he wanted their input. He wouldn't have known what their input was and their input was terrible. But all right so here's this is like one of my favorite things like when I was getting ready like this thought this aha moment I had and here's how I wrote it down and it's not, I'm not saying like it's but here's how I wrote it down. Where did I write it down? Um <laughs> Hold on. Here it is. Verse 5. Here's, here was my thought. So Jacob is, Jacob, the wise, should be the wise one, did nothing, and ultimately we saw gave, gave himself over to the decision of the younger ones. Here's, here's what I wrote down. This was my thought. Guys, specifically, men in the room, there are some decisions that need to be made by the most mature player in the room. And this has direct implications to what it means to be the head of a house. That there are times where you must exert authority by God's guidance, even if your family wants something different. And Jacob at least failed to do that. So again, there are times you're going to find yourself as a husband, as a wife in the absence of a husband, as an adult in the absence of more mature people, whether it's in your job or, or whatever, the decision needs to be made by the most mature person in the room. Jacob should have been the most mature person in this conversation, and he didn't do it. He chose, allowed something different to happen than, than what should have happened. Any more comments? Yeah. Talk louder. And the fact that they were super wealthy, handsome, they were pretty or feminine, whatever. Yeah. Could this determination not have been after the fact that they wanted their wealth to go to their husband instead of their children? So I don't know, but that very much, we, we just found out that very much was their motivation. At So whether the rape was planned or not, there's no reason to think that. But you're a Absolutely right that they saw it as a means for gain. Apparently not, because they they propose this idea and deceitfully the brothers say, yeah, "Okay." Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Right. Yeah, we're going to talk about revenge. The Bible says a lot about this. So again, I want to make it so, like I'm, I want to be so clear. What happened to Dinah was horrible, and something needed to happen. Okay, something needed to happen, but we're not going to find it here. He was absent. Yo, Jacob, where were you in that first verse? Right? Hmm. All right. So, here's what happens. You got three players. You got the, the, well, you got three groups that I want us to look at. And there's this awesome lesson in the middle of this. 
you got Jacob's sons who trick deceitfully, to use the biblical word. They are deceitful and say, hey, here's an idea. All of you get circumcised and then we'll let Dinah be in your family. It was a lie, but it was worse than a lie, and I'll tell you why in just a second. Then you got Shechem, who's like, for some reason, plainly not pure, whether it's lust or power or narcissist, I don't know what it was, but he's like, I'm willing to get circumcised if I can have what I want. And then you got Hamor and the people of the city who are like, like not, I don't want to be funny. They're asking a lot of them, right? Mm -hmm. Hey, guys, I know you don't get the daughter, but I'm going to need you to be circumcised. Let me explain what that means to you. And the men of the city are willing to be circumcised to gain the wealth that Jacob represents to them. We don't want this dude to move away. He does commerce in our, in our community. And ultimately the heart of Hamor is I'll get circumcised to get what Jacob has. So his motivation is money. The common denominator, and this is the tremendous lesson found in this, the common denominator is circumcision, which was a holy symbol that God put in place to remind Abraham and his offspring of the covenant love that God had for his children. And nobody in this story is treating it as holy. They're using it to get revenge. They're lying about what it represents. They're using it to, to justify the rape of a girl. They're using it to get wealthy. And while I can read this story and be like, I can't imagine that. But you know what I can't imagine? You know what I can tell you stories about? Using things that God intends to be holy in my own sin. I can tell you stories about that. I can tell you stories about taking something that God has said is beautiful and perverting it to do something to please myself. It's not rape. This is really good commentary. Um, if you, so some of you are budding Bible scholars. There's a very high, uh, much printed commentary series. The authors are Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown. It's a, it's, a, it's a very comprehensive set of commentary. This is what they say on this. Nothing is said of their teaching the people to worship the true God. So we're to the part where he, what, what they're saying in this commentary is, notice that God, Jehovah, is absent. There's no discussion of this. Circumcision is reduced to a transactional thing that will allow me, in their case, to get revenge. Nothing is said of their teaching the people to worship the true God, but only of their insisting on their being circumcised. And it is evident that they did not seek to convert Shechem, but only made a show of religion to cloak and cover their diabolical design. Listen to this. Good tattoo. Hypocrisy is a joke. Hypocrisy and deceit in all cases are vicious are infinitely more so when accompanied with a show of religion. And they go on to say, And here are the sons of Jacob, under the pretense of scruples, concealing a scheme of treachery as cruel and diabolical as was perhaps ever per perpetrated. God had not said much to his people at this point. And he had said, here's the mark, circumcision. And we are three generations into this, God is absent, and they're using this mark to do something sinful. And while I hope nobody in the room can find themselves planning to murder a whole city, everybody in this room can be guilty from time to time of taking what God has said is precious and holy and using it for something less than precious and holy now. Here's what happens. 25, on the third day when they were sore, how about that? On the third day when they were sore, two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords and came against the city while it felt secure and killed all the males. Again, don't picture 
anything like what we consider a city today. This was likely a settlement, super concentrated group of people, and they were sore. They killed Hamor. They killed his son Shechem with the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went away. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys, and whatever was in the city and in the field, all their wealth, all their little ones, and their wives, all that was in their house, they captured and plundered. So, revenge. I echo. It is completely understandable that when it was discovered that Dinah had been raped, that there was indignant anger. But friends, the Bible is abjectly clear that revenge, that revenge belongs to God. Jacob should have done something. Jacob should have done a bunch of different things. But it is never okay, even in the name of revenge, to so, so human revenge is wrong. It's a sin. But the sins, to, 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 to paraphrase the commentary we just read, is amped up because they used things that, they, they, they acted like they were being religious, but they really were trying to do something that God has said repeatedly. Not yet, but he will say, we see on this side of the covenant, vengeance is mine. I'll tend to this. I'm just. Either on the cross Think about the worst sins perpetrated against you and your family. And, my, and it's very likely that somebody in this room can painfully identify with parts of what we just read. But you hear me out. You believe this. Either that sin is paid for on the cross by the sacrifice of Christ, or that sin will be paid for in hell. And either should satisfy you. Vengeance is God's. And he is a much better avenger than you or I could ever be. Something needed to happen. So let's end with this. What should Jacob have done? So let's get, so I agree. Jacob's absent in the first four verses. But Jacob finds out that his daughter's been raped. What should Jacob have done? set up camp outside of their city and were like, we're going to make this a bright scheme. I'm not going to be around. I'm going to let my daughter get captured. There's no reason in the scripture to think that that's what happened, but we, I, can, <laughs> I, I, I will say this. Um, that, that would explain why he didn't immediately like react to it and go down the train. He let them like make the decision. But in his mind, The reason that I can tell you that's not true is because we'll see later that Jacob exacted a very stout consequence for Simeon and Levi. So Jacob finally, unilaterally it seems, it appears from the passage, said to Simeon and Levi, no inheritance for you. And those two, those two tribes were scattered. Ironically, one of them disappeared. The tribe of Simeon, we don't know what happened to it. But how about this plot twist, second time I've used that phrase. Who did, the, who, did the, who did Levi's people become? Yeah. So there's something to be said about God's grace in that. What, what should have Jacob have done? <laughs> Shake it. Get right. I mean, he should have prayed. He should have sought. Yeah. Hey, Church listen. Answer. Hey, Church answer, and so right? listen. I mean, so listen to me. I'm not saying, like, you're going to read into this something. You're going you're gonna to read into something. Don't do this. He never, he never sought God's wisdom at all. And God is right, and we will difficultly wrestle with where God says to his people, 
here's my punishment for these people. You go do it. But it, it, there was no mention of him addressing God. Who's to say that God, again, please be careful with what I'm fixing to say. Be careful with what I'm about to say. Who's to say that God would not have said, Shechem will be held responsible for this. Take you and some of your sons and go, and this is what I, how I judge that you should react, and then leave. I'm not saying that's what they should have done. But Kyle's point's a great one. God, what should we do? And that's absent. Any other thoughts about what Jacob should have done? We have no, we, we, we can, no, we don't know. We don't know. So listen, here's, here's, here's what we do know. Jacob wrestles with God. The next day he reconciles with Esau. Esau goes 100 miles away. Jacob goes four miles away, but not to here. He ends up outside. What we don't know is how far are we from the day, uh, I'm sorry, the day or two after he reconciles with Esau to he had pinched his tent up. We don't know. It, but it couldn't have been very long. It couldn't have been too terribly long because Dinah was born, you know, it, it wasn't 50 years. The Bible's full of that. Elijah. In the best movie scene in the Bible where Elijah defeats the prophets of Baal, the next day he's terrified of an of a absentee queen, right? I mean, I'm not immune. Of, like, I can come home from youth camp and look at pornography, right? I can come home from adult camp and look at pornography, right? I mean, the, right. All right, we got to finish. Any other, any other comments? Any uh, anything else? I would say that uh, along the same line that that you know if if it's not if they didn't use the if it wasn't the speech of it but like along with the praise you know you know maybe along the lines that you would have to say to say I'm sorry for this you would also have to say if there's something you need to have said that is implicit in speech we can have we we could have led with it. That's right. We could have been present and now when your son came. He should have said, yeah, we can cast stones rightfully at everybody in the story. <laughs> so friends, listen, this is difficult to read. It exists for a reason in scripture. God has, has chosen to include this in scripture to teach us something. At least consider this as you think about this horrific story. You and your family will not be immune from mistreatment. Vengeance is not to be yours. And in the anger that Simeon and Levi had, they tried to administer some perverted wrath and it ended up killing and destroying. The punishment did not fit the crime. This is a horrible story. Be good dads, be good moms, seek the Lord when times are difficult. His wisdom is far, far greater than yours, especially when we are driven by the passions of the flesh. There are consequences for refusing to be a faithful person in every way. Yeah. All right, I'm sorry. Let's pray. <coughs> oh, Lord, I feel like a broken record sometimes. And I can read this story. I, you, like, you know my thoughts. I read this story and I'm like, oh, these guys are so much not like me. I would never do that to un somebody that was less powerful than me. I would never do that to gain money. I would never do that to get revenge. And yet, God, if I am separated by one 
inch from your Holy Spirit, I can quickly go back to that. Father, I acknowledge, having read this horrific story, that it's by the grace of your goodness toward me that I'm not any one of these people in this story. Father, help us to love your hatred of sin, but Father, help me never to be the the arbiter of that. Help me never to decide, apart from you, what should happen when I'm mistreated. Father, remind me of, of my weakness apart from you. And Father, let it be the result of studying these type passages that, as always, we learn about ourselves, what we're capable of, and the, and the harm that comes when we act out of ourselves and not act by your guidance. Amen.